Welcome back to Sector 666. Today we are looking at three creepiest traditions around the world. Don't forget to like and subscribe to support us. Seppuku, also known as Harakiri, is the honorable approach to taking one's very own life. The term Harakiri, although well known to foreigners, is seldom utilized by Japanese, who like the term Seppuku. It was initially reserved for samurai in their code of honor. Still, it had also been practiced by other Japanese people during the Showa period to bring back honor for themselves and their families. The first recorded seppuku act was carried out by Minamoto no Yorimasa over the Battle of Uji in 1180. As a samurai practice, seppuku was used voluntarily by samurai to die with honor rather than fall into the hands of their enemies or even performed as they had brought shame to themselves. Samurai may also be ordered by their daimyo, feudal lords, to perform seppuku. The appropriate way of committing the act, formulated over a few generations, was plunging a short sword, typically a tanto, into the left side area of the abdomen, bringing the blade laterally across to the right, after which switch it upward and when the samurai was completed, he stretched out his neck for an assistant to sever his spinal cord. It was the assistant's duty to decapitate the samurai in a single swing, or else it will bring great shame on the assistant and his family. Being an excruciating and slow means of committing suicide, it was preferred under Bushido warrior code as a highly effective method to exhibit the samurai's firm resolve, self-control, and courage and demonstrate the sincerity of purpose. Women of the samurai class even committed ritual suicide, known as jigai, but rather than slicing the abdomen, they slashed their throats with a short sword or dagger. The primary purpose was to achieve a certain and quick death to avoid capture. Before committing suicide, a woman will usually tie her knees together so her body will be discovered in a dignified pose, despite the convulsions of death. Sometimes a daimyo, feudal lord, was called upon to execute seppuku as the groundwork of a peace agreement. This weakened the defeated clan, therefore, resistance efficiently ceased. Toyotomi Hideyoshi, a Japanese samurai and daimyo of the late Sengoku period regarded as the second great unifier of Japan, made use of an enemy's suicide in this manner on a few occasions, most remarkable of which successfully ended a dynasty of daimyos. When the Hojo clan was defeated at Odawara in 1590, Hideyoshi insisted on the suicide of Hojo Ujimasa, a retired daimyo of the Hojo clan who achieved the most significant territory in the clan's history and the exile of his child Eugeneo, with this particular act of committing suicide, the strongest daimyo family unit in eastern Japan was completely defeated. Sati or sati was a practice, now mostly historical, in which a widow sacrifices herself by sitting atop her deceased husband's funeral pyre. Although never widely practiced, the sati was the ideal of womanly devotion held by some royal castes of India. Sathi is derived from the name of the goddess Sathi, one of the wives of the god Shiva and a daughter of the sage Doxa. Sathi married Shiva against her father's wishes. She threw herself into the sacrificial fire, since she couldn't bear her father Dekshu's humiliation of her and her husband Shiva, and was eventually reborn as the goddess Parvati. But in this particular myth, Shiva is still alive and avenges Sathi's death. The word Sathi appears in Sanskrit and Hindi texts, where it's synonymous with good wife. Greek sources from around 300 BCE make isolated mention of Sathi. However, it likely developed into a real sacrifice in the medieval era within the northwestern Rajput clans, to which it remained limited, to become more prevalent during the late Middle Ages. The very first explicit reference to the practice in Sanskrit is found in the great epic Mahabharata, compiled in its current form approximately 400 CE. Women, in some cases, suffered immolation before their husbands expected death in battle, in that case, the burning was known as Jauhar. In the Muslim period, 12th to 16th century, the Rajputs practiced Jauhar, most notably at Chittorgar, to save females from rape, which they considered even worse compared to death, at the hands of conquering enemies. In the early 19th century, the East India Company, in the process of extending its rule to the majority of India, at first accepted the practice, 
William Carey, a British Christian evangelist, noted 438 incidents within a 30-mile radius of the capital Calcutta, in 1803, despite its ban within Calcutta. Between 1815 and 1818, the number of incidents of Safi in Bengal doubled from 378 to 839. Opposition to the practice of Safi by missionaries like William Carey and Hindu reformers like Ram Mohan Roy ultimately led Lord William Bentinck, British Governor General of India, to enact the Bengal Safi Regulation, 1829, according to which the practice of burning or live burial of Hindu widows became punishable by criminal courts. Scattered cases continue to happen, most notoriously in the instance of Rup Kumwar, an 18-year-old widow who committed sati in 1987. The event was extremely controversial, as groups throughout India either publicly defended Kumwar's actions or declared she'd been murdered. Adhering to this event, the Indian government enacted the Rajasthan Safi Prevention Ordinance, 1987, on 1 October 1987 and later passed the Commission of Safi. Prevention Act, 1987. The Prevention of Safi Act makes it unlawful to support, glorify, or try to commit Safi. Supporting Safi, which includes coercing or forcing somebody to commit Safi, can be punished with life imprisonment or death. In contrast, glorifying Safi can be punished with one to seven years in prison. Celestial Burials, or Sky Burials are the burial rites of preference for the Tibetans. When a member of the community dies, the body is wrapped in white Tibetan cloth and placed for three or five days in the corner of the home, during which monks or lamas are asked to read the scripture aloud so that souls may be released from purgatory. Family members stop other activities to create a peaceful environment to allow the ascension of souls into heaven. The corpse is then positioned on a mountaintop to decompose while exposed to the elements or be consumed by scavenging animals, particularly carrion birds. It's practiced in Tibet as well as the Chinese provinces. The majority of Tibetans and many Mongolians follow Vajrayana Buddhism, which teaches the transmigration of spirits. The body is now an empty container, so there is no need to preserve it. It can be eaten by birds or through natural processes such as decomposition. The purpose of sky burial is just to dispose of the remains as generously as possible. In the past, cremation was limited to lamas and other dignitaries, but today's technology and problems with sky burial have resulted in increased usage of cremation by citizens. There is hardly any written evidence or physical proof of this practice, as the remains are eaten by vultures or other creatures but it is thought to have been practiced for as much as 11,000 years. The Tibetan sky burials appear to have developed from old practices of defleshing bodies, as evidenced by archaeological discoveries in the region. It is likely that these practices originated for practical reasons. The majority of Tibet is located above the tree line, and the shortage of timber renders cremation economically impractical. Subsurface interment is also tricky because the active layer is not more than a few centimeters deep, with solid rock or permafrost beneath the surface. Vultures, according to most accounts, are provided the whole body. When only the bones remain, these are split up using mallets, ground barley flour, tea and yak butter or milk and given to the crows and hawks waiting for the vultures to depart.